yeah, you know baby. how it goes. Yeah, baby. Pep for talk. Pep talk. Stamina for sale. Anthony Yard. It's a movie. You know the set. <laughs> Let's go, bro. You know how it goes. <laughs> Pep talk, you guys. It's time. Everyone talk good game, but it don't really face me. Oh. The man that ain't mad like Max, the way that I'm murky like Ace B. And them got what the slide on the back ball. Oi, oi! Welcome to the Pep Talk UK Sports Podcast, the podcast that talks the major boxing and football news from around the globe. Real points of view from a real panel. Hashtag Real Talk on Pep Talk. Please subscribe to Pep Talk UK on iTunes and YouTube. Don't forget to like, share, and comment. Now, I'm your host, Frankie B, and I'm joined by a sick panel. Firstly, I'd like to introduce the pep talk boy from the deepest part of Finchley. It's MJ the Red. How you doing, bro? Frankie B, MJ, back in the building. Really, really excited, Frankie B. We just had bonfire night. And you know what? There are also fireworks out of the boxing as well this weekend. It was, a, it was, was. crazy watching Deontay Wilder. But you know what? The biggest fireworks, Frankie B, uh, what has actually stunned the boxing world was Deontay Wilder's video calling out Anthony Joshua yes. next year. Let's have this mega fight. It was a little bit WWE, mm-hmm. but at the same time, I loved it. Yes, indeed, indeed. And, you know, um, you can't blame the man. He, you know, he wants to go out there. He wants to have the fight straight away so he can um, line his pockets, mate. You know? Well, to be honest, Frankie B, it's about time. We we spent so much time on this podcast talking about Deontay Wilder and the, and the politics in boxing. The reason why big fights haven't happened, especially with Deontay, mm-hmm. really being up against someone. So this weekend, watching Deontay actually have that first round knockout and actually call out Anthony Joshua, I'm super excited. But you know what? I'm looking forward to discussing this all the other major topics in boxing as well as football with all the panellists today. Indeed, indeed. Just, just a quick word on, on Meek Mill, MJ. Go to the side. <laughs> yeah, your, boy, right. your boy Meek. Yeah, all right. It's, uh, mate, it's, I tell you what, it's not the first, it's not the biggest L he's taken in the last few years. Let's put it that way. <laughs> That'll be Nicki Minaj, <laughs> yeah? Leave it him. <laughs> You know, it's not even that. We can talk about back to back. We can keep on going. Oh, so, I tell you, you know. Yeah. How can? Yeah, how yeah. can? What about Drake? Do you think he'd be happy with him going inside, Meek Mill? Well, well to be honest, well, the news on Drake, he's actually he's he's doing Top Boy, isn't he? Yeah, he's Top Boy. Twenty nineteen. He can kind of loosely base it around Meek Mill, <laughs> something like that. You know, the street the street <laughs> rapper. But you know what? I mean, looking forward to discussing all these points with everyone on the pod today. It should be lit. Yeah, indeedy. You want to shout out your social media before we keep it moving, MJ? Yeah, MJ, uh, on Instagram, follow me, like underscore Mike28, and on Twitter, find me, MJ, Pet Talk Boy. Send me some abuse, send me some nice stuff, but most importantly, interact. MJ, and as you would say, shout out to all my boss beasts, wife and brothers. Right, now I'd like to welcome... An esteemed boxing trainer from IQ Boxing. It's Xavier Miller. How you doing, bro? Um, very well, thank you. Yeah, very you, well. Mr. X, how's uh, your stable of fighters? Doing really well. Uh, currently got four. Um, two have already gone out. One boxed three times, the other one two times. And the other two have got their debuts. One the 25th of November, another one the 2nd of December. Yeah. So it's been a very um, busy year. Interesting year. Yeah. Uh, Yusef Super Kamari. Yeah, he boxed um, on the Groves, uh, Cox on the card. And Tun Jai, Uncle T, boxed on the... Uh, That's it, yeah. Uncle T on the Joe Joyce Lewis on the card. So they've, 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 um, they've had some good exposure. And um, you know, I think it's five battles together so far. And they've, they've won all of them, so... So, Doing really well. Would you call your stable the X Men? Get it? 
I mean, they're, they're all they're all signed under Steve. They're all managed and signed with Steve Goodwin. Mm-hmm. Um, but they're going to come out of um, Lee's the Nike Boxing Club. So, um, well, most of them have anyway. Um, uh, Yasser, my other one, he's uh, he came. He was originally at Finchley Boxing Club, and they went mm-hmm. to Islington. Um, Tunjai was at a amateur boxing club in Essex, near to where he lives. And then when he turned pro, he came over to me. Um, but I've had Yusef and Dennis for quite a long time. Yusef spent he had his, his, his youth career was at All Stars, but as a senior, he's been with me. He had about 15, 20 bouts of amateur, and then he turned pro with me this year. So, um, yeah. yeah, lots more, lots more to come. But I've got a whole gym and about another five returning pro next year. So Ooh. I'm trying to uh, my uh, my whole. Like approach has always been. Um, I like the way Manny Stewart used to do his business. You know, he had mm-hmm. his amateurs, then yeah. he kept Rest them and turned them over. Yeah, you know, one of my um, my heroes, one of the guys that I learned a lot from. You know, studying along with Floyd Mayweather Senior and Eddie Fudge. Um And I wanted, I wanted to basically do the same thing. I wanted to have my amateurs, and then I wanted to keep them and turn pro with them. So that's what I've done. From what I've heard, you've got a talented bunch of fighters. So I'm yeah, sure the future will be lit. Yep. Now Xavier, do you want to shout out your social media handles? <laughs> I'm not great with this. Um, I've, I've, I've one of the ladies I work with, um, uh, Sophia Bonesnick. She handles most of that for me because she does like the, the marketing stuff. So, um, but it's uh, I know the Instagram is IQ Xavier Miller, and um, I think my Facebook is just Xavier Miller. But pretty straightforward. It's X X A V I E R M I L L E R. Cracking, cracking. Before we move on, you want to shout out Wolverine, Cyclops? <laughs> <laughs> I get that now, especially with the professor thing now as well. It's like, yeah. it wasn't meant to be like that, but, you know, I, I, I used to watch a lot of Azuma Nelson, so... Oh, know, yeah, yeah. African yeah. legend. Go on in, legend, mate. Yep, special. Special. Cracking, cracking. Right. Now, finally, I'd like to welcome a man in boxing terms that's strapped up. It's the Commonwealth <laughs> Cruiserweight Champion. It's Luke the Duke Watkins. How you doing, my G? I'm very well, very well. No, it's, it's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, it's, it's a pleasure to be, you know, in the presence of the Duke. It sounds like boxing royalty, brother. <laughs> nah, it's the Duke of the Commonwealth. <laughs> there you go, there you go, man. So, what's going on? Obviously, you're fighting uh, December the 2nd, Leicester Arena. How's things, how's training going and preparations? Yeah, training's going good. Um, you know what, this, is, this life's like this. Eat, sleep, train, repeat. And uh, f- for, I'm sure it's boxing fans, and they understand that. But it is just hard graft, you know, and I'll get a deserved break over the Christmas. But training's going well. But, you know, you've, you've done pretty well, you know, um, in a short space of time, managing to pick up that Commonwealth. You know, it seems like it's been kind of like a roller coaster ride so far, you know? Straight to a strap. Um, something like that. I just believe everything. There's a, an Arabic word called maktab, um, and it just mean, it means everything's written. And I believe my path's going to go the exact way it's meant to go: ups, downs, highs, lows. You know, and I'm just embracing it. Yeah, life in the fast lane of the Duke. So, what about what about preparations for your opponent on December the second, Mike uh, Stafford? Know much about him? Um, I, I, I've taken a look at a couple of couple of his latest fight videos uh, I'm aware that he's uh, he's educated he knows what he's up to in the ring he's got good hands and uh, he's got a great engine and, and for me that's great he's going to test me and that's what I want I want to test myself whilst I'm doing this and know how well I am and how good I am and uh and the rest will be history we met at Punch London I see you were getting some good sparring in yes yes it was Frank Frank Bugliano that was good that was good yeah, excellent, excellent. So, speaking of the future, being the champion yourself, uh, a good friend of Pep Talk, um, Isaac Chamberlain, he, he wants he wants your strap, mate. He wants your strap, mate. He wants to get it on uh, for the future. Uh, you've got the likes of Lawrence O'Coley as well out there. Now, how are you going to fight off these challenges? In the ring. That's how it's done. <laughs> um, you know, someone someone said to me after the night I won that, coming off, they said, ah. Oh, You've got a target on your back, and I was like, mm. "You know, I'm just. Uh, this is five minutes of being the Commonwealth." I'm like, "What? What are you talking about?" By the time I woke up the next day, I'm like, "Yo, I want to fight you." I'm just like, "Yeah, slow down, man. <laughs> <laughs> Let me rest up, you know." But obviously, 
for my career, we've got, me and my coach Paddy, our manager, we've got our own agenda. We've been handling business, doing things our way, and uh, they've all got promoters. So when the time's right, and when their promoters come calling, and then we can talk business. I don't think any fight will come any sooner or later than when it's meant to be, you know. And, and you know how boxing works. There's so many politics and and stuff that goes on behind the scenes, and everyone's everyone's on their own agenda. So when it happens, it will happen. Indeed. Well, when it happens, we'll be looking forward to it, and I'll be ringside, mate, with uh, a big bowl of popcorn, mate. So yeah, sweet. Yeah. Don't <laughs> blink. <laughs> right, um, Luke, you want to shout out your social media before we keep it moving? Yeah. All my platforms are the same as. The Duke Watkins, check me out, hit me up. Like MJ said earlier on, interact, that's what it's for, it's social media. Don't be ghost followers. Let me know what you're <laughs> thinking, people. And no trolling, no trolling. Just one word for the for the Swindon Massive. <laughs> ah, come on, Swindon, I love you. <laughs> <laughs> These people It's a proper fight in town and uh, I've got nothing but love for them. Yeah. Shout out to my broad hinting family, you know? All good, all good. <laughs> oh yeah, just over the hill. Ladies and gents, for the fight fans locked in, for the football fans locked in, now it's time for some real talk on Pep Talk. Let's go! Yes, we ready? Let's get into it. It's real talk, it's Pep Talk. So we're going to start with the boxing and we start at the Barclay Card Arena in Brooklyn where Deontay Wilder dispatched with the main Stavern in a single round via KO. Now MJ, Wilder opened up a can of whoop ass on Stavern. Are you now convinced he's a credible champion? Frankie B, I've always said, you know what? Deontay always beats everyone in front of him, so we have to give him the respect. So you're a believer. Has. You're a believer now. No, no. Listen, <laughs> I, listen, I wouldn't. Listen, I wouldn't go that far. He still has a few things to show us to let us know if he's on Joshua's level. I mean, what we do have to say is that Stavern did show up at pretty short notice. Mm-hmm. I mean, he hadn't boxed for over two years, and he was relying on the fact that he went. He went pretty well during their first, uh, the first yeah. fight. He went the yeah. full 12 rounds of him, yeah. but he, yeah, knocked he down a few full times. 12. Exactly, and he looked quite good. But he looked overweight, he looked out of shape. He looked like he hadn't really done much boxing, much training, but he looked like he came to secure the bag. Now, he actually got the money. <laughs> the duffel well, bag, yeah? Unfortunately, what we saw, especially the knockdown, it was pretty brutal which Deontay has always done. He's always beaten everyone in front of him. So he deserves the respect he actually deserves because a lot of people do actually talk about him dodging fights and a lot of politics around fights in which, but in his fault, when you look at it, he's had a few top fights which he could have had. Yes. Which is which because, not been his fault. Yeah, which, well, yeah, circumstances beyond his ability. But ultimately... He did the damn. You can only beat who's in front of you. And when you look at that man's record, you need to salute and say, you know what? He is the real deal. But the excitement about him calling out Anthony Joshua and what's going to happen in future, I think we need to watch this face. That is the face everyone in the heavyweight, all heavyweight boxing fans would love to see. I mean, it's been great watching the Floyd Mayweathers and all this stuff. All the welterweights and the middleweights, which are absolutely awesome. But we want to see the heavyweight go to battle. And you know what? I'm pretty excited, Frankie B. And I believe there's going to be some exciting times, like Deontay Wilder says, in a heavyweight division. Right. <laughs> <laughs> now, Luke, um, was it a case that Wilder was exceptional or... Was Stavern really poor in the night for you? Yeah, I think Stavern was poor, I'm honest. Uh, he come in about a stone heavier. Mm. And he hasn't boxed for a while. You know, when he first fought Wilder, you could see you could see the hunger in him, even yeah, in the a bit fight, more competitive. You know? Yeah. Definitely. I think he uh, in my opinion, and it's only my opinion, so I don't mean nothing, I just think he turned up to get paid. Uh, and it was it was a it was good for Wilder, um, but I don't think we've seen what Wilder can offer 
people forget that Wilder can box because he outboxed the Verne for 12 rounds. Mm-hmm. You know, and he time, boxed, he yeah. boxed the, yeah, he did. He even boxed the good Stavern. So, for him to stop him like that on a overweight, under trained Stavern, it's good for him. Um, but who knows? Yeah. <laughs> it, you know, what it is. It certainly sent a, sent a statement out, you know, to a lot of doubters, even though Stavern went great. You know, a knockout always is very impressionable. You know, it is. It has kind of set up the fight with Joshua. You know, I, b- I believe they're in talks. You know, Eddie Hearn yeah. and uh, Deontay's people. I, I think that's a good fight. I um, I do think that's a good fight. I'm really looking forward to that. If I'm honest, uh, we've seen that Joshua can be hurt. Um, also, from when he goes into the later rounds, he takes a slight dip in his performance before he revamps and gets his second win. Um, we haven't really seen Wilder go that far other than with Stavern. So it's interesting. There's a lot of, a lot of pieces lot of to the puzzle that. Yeah, yeah. yeah definitely. Look, you know, Wilder, you know, for all his KOs, he's fought really nobody. Let's be real. All right? Very true. Very true. Joshua <laughs> has a much better resume. A much better resume. I couldn't see Deontay Wilder blast Nat Klitschko. Now, Xavier. Um, yeah. Critics have um, rounded on Deontay Wilder. Is it now time to take him a bit more seriously? Um, him and the, the bomb squad. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he's a, he's a good coach. He was a fantastic amateur. Um, and I hear a lot of people saying that they feel that uh, Joshua's like skill set is better. Mm-hmm. I don't. I don't personally see that. I think. I think it, it will make a good fight because I think they both have flaws. Yeah. Uh, they both don't look polished to me. Um, but I definitely wouldn't sit here and say that Joshua is more skilled than Wild Eye. Yes, Wild Eye, yes, he can be wild. But he, yeah. there's, there's, there's some things that he does better than Joshua. So to me, it, it's in the balance. It's a good fight. Oh. I'm, look, I'm looking forward to when it does happen. And at the moment, I can't pick a winner to win us again. You, you say there's some things that he does better than Joshua. What, what you're referring to mm. is uh, his movement around the ring. I think it's, it's his ability to, to switch up a game plan if he needs to, I think is, is, is a bit more rounded than Joshua for me. I mean, as someone mentioned earlier, you know, he did box and box well for 12 rounds against the Burn the first time. As the Burn is dangerous. I mean, this version, this time, time round, no. But the first time, yes, he was dangerous. And he was able to keep him at the end of the jab. You know, obviously he's been well schooled and well drilled to do so. And, I, and, I'm, and I'm, I'm a big fan of Joshua. I kind of grew up in the same sort of area, so I do. I do. I kind of. Well, I know him. Okay. Um, okay. So I'm, just hoping, I'm just. I'm just hoping. I'm hoping. The next well, eighteen months. Then obviously, you know, he's a bit more settled, a bit more counted, and he can go on to do what I think he's going to do. But at the moment, still looks a little bit vulnerable. For me. Obviously, Deontay Wilder, he, he weighed in at fifteen and a half um, stone, and Joshua's last fight yep. was his career heaviest. Is it eighteen, eighteen two or yep. so? Um, that weight, yep. surely the two fight is going to make a difference. You know, it's going to be a lot more solid than uh, Wilder Joshua is. Uh, for me, it's an advantage for Wilder. Mm-hmm. Uh, Joshua eating too much weight, a little bit too much muscle. You see, Wilder's a bit more athletic. He's just, you know, he's tall, he's rangy, he's got that that hell of a right hand. And if you can't get out of the way of it, you've got a problem. And Joshua's carrying. He, he seems to. He does seem to have a stamina problem in the middle of a fight. I haven't seen that with Wilder. He's swinging, but he's still able to recover a lot quicker. And it's 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 strange because he said he doesn't really do any running. But he's um, and Joshua does so much. You know, strength and conditioning training. You know fitness training so I don't know it just it just Wilder seems a little bit more a little bit more relaxed to me like over the 12 rounds than, than Joshua does Joshua seems like he needs to take one or two rounds to recover I haven't really seen Wilder having to do that so I, mm. I think that because Wilder's I think he's, he made his pro debut like in 2008 or something mm-hmm. and then Joshua's like 2013 that's probably going to be the difference Wilder's just been at this a lot longer Wow, and you can't, and you can't, you can't buy experience. You can buy a lot of it in this world, but experience, no. Well, Luke, just a question to you: Is um, you know, Xavier's kind of uh, he's kind of favouring Deontay Wilder if the big fight goes ahead, but in reality, you know, Molina he rocked Deontay Wilder. Now, yeah. <laughs> Anthony Joshua destroyed Molina. All right, so. 
for you, I mean, who who would you favour if this big super fight goes ahead in 2018? Right now, um, right now, I'd most probably say Wilder. Wow. Wow, we got two Wilder. Yeah. Wow, we've got, we, we got a nah. bomb squad in the house. <laughs> nah, nah, nah. Trust me, I, I want AJ to win, man. 100% through and through. But you're just asking from a neutral position. You know, I think mm-hmm. at the moment, Wilder. Joshua against Takam. Takam was catching Joshua. Mm-hmm. You know? And I'm not saying Wilder's head movement or his movement is as good as Takam's, but he can move. Wilder can move. He's not a very stationary fighter. Um, a lot of Joshua's success has been in one dimension, which is backwards and forwards. It's mm-hmm. not very... He doesn't come in, out and around and take angles. But even when Wilder stopped Stavern the other day, he dropped his shoulder left and then rolled round to the right and finished him off. Yeah. You know, And then it just shows you that even though he's hunting for blood, he's still thinking and his boxing brain is still working. And I just think at this very moment today, I just think I'd give it to Wilder. But... Wow. Wilder can be hit and uh, we've seen that and Joshua can bang yeah. and you know when uh, Molina caught him he did do a bit of the Harlem shake let's be honest yeah, yeah he was dancing <laughs> <laughs> oh, MJ you know, he, did, he, did, yeah. he did the Harlem shake but he didn't drop <laughs> Uh, which, which means he's a good dancer, man. He's got good balance, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, MJ, um, you know, we've got two for um, Deontay Wilder. Uh, are you going to be behind AJ? Do you think he, if it goes ahead, will be the favourite in this fight? To be honest, to be, to be, I reckon it's going to be two and I. I'm not going to be joining over as part of the bomb squad. But what I will say is <laughs> Anthony Joshua did show up a lot more. Mos- I think in the past he's been called a skinny bodybuilder. But it was by Dillian White trying to throw a few jabs at him. But AJ was really, really big. But that's because he was preparing for a different fight. I think if he actually went to fight Deontay Wilder... I'm sure he was going to shred down and he's going to, because he's going to need to be more mobile. mobile yeah. Over the last two hours, we've actually had AJ actually say, you know what, I do accept the challenge, but I will fight him on my terms, which is making everyone kind of think that maybe he's not thinking about possibly the next fight, but at some point next summer. But I, in my opinion, I, I do reckon AJ will still have Deontay Wilder just because AJ has been in there with Klitschko and has fought some really... Deontay has not really come up against any one of any... I mean, don't get me wrong, it's a heavyweight division and they can both bang, which is what I was talking about, fireworks. It's going to be amazing having both of them there. Who's going to win? Well, you're going to be flipping a coin. But if you ask me to put some money on it, I'm going with AJ. Wow, T1, T1. Cracking stuff, cracking stuff. Well, you know what? Um, either way, you know, I'm sure it's going to happen eventually. If it's not the next fight, it will happen soon. Um, there's talk of um, uh, uh, Joseph Parker, you know, coming into the equation and fighting even AJ or fighting Deontay Wilder. So there's some exciting fights ahead, and we know AJ sells out arenas, you know. But it, it, Xavier, just on a, um, a technical point of view, uh, as a boxing coach. Um, these like windmills that Deontay Wilder does. I mean, please, can you break down the scientific uh, meaning behind those uh, wild swings, mate? I, I think a lot of times he's, he's just so eager to get the job done, and it, I, I think he's got a lot of belief in his athletic ability because he seems to better get out of the way um, when they start firing back. Um, a lot of it he does do at range as well, but when he gets, he's, it's like when he's hurt his man. He's not composed goes, yeah. and like pick shot, but he's already. It seems like he's already hurt his opponent. So he's not really too concerned about what's coming back. I think that's why he's a bit wild. But um, you know, obviously, a, a better quality of opposition will make him pay for it, and he hasn't had that yet. And whether that AJ or not, I don't know. Luke, just to just to finish off with you, um, I quote I quote the words of Deontay Wilder: "I want Joshua. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the champ. I'm the best." Are you ready for the test? How entertaining was it's that? <laughs> entertaining. <laughs> I think um, Dante Wilder, well, he's good. He's entertaining. He, uh, you need people like him in boxing. And he's good for the sport. And I think when the fight happens, it's, it's going to be electric. It will be, you know, because he could certainly, you know, he could certainly sell a fight. Um, in terms of vocally, he could sell a fight. And, um, you know, AJ puts bombs on seats regardless. So... 
Should be a statement for you. Sure. I can't wait. Without a doubt. Yeah. <laughs> Without a doubt. Okay. What stadium's big enough? Oh, yeah, I mean. It, it's well it won't, it won't go to Nigeria but I'm sure it, Wembley Stadium I'm sure they might pick that venue if it's available but um, either way it's, it's going to be um, a great fight a great fight a very hyped fight as well now moving on there's talk potentially next year of another big fight the rumour advanced talks and that's uh, Mikey Garcia and Jorge Leonares now Xavier another big unification champion versus champion at lightweight Garcia's proved his credentials at 140 pounds yeah. has unfinished business at 135 okay. uh, it seems like he kind of wants to clean up uh, I'm, I'm a big fan of Garcia because he just he's just patient yeah. you know he doesn't, he doesn't seem to weigh shots um, and he's really confident he's good he, he, usually though, when, I'm, when I'm watching he seems to come forward comes up really well good solid jab um, but then you've got Lenares this just looks technically, technically beautiful to watch it's, it's just it's yeah. smooth it's like jazz it's, it's nice and he, he, seem, he seems to be able to move around the ring and his his hair doesn't get messed up either I mean it's, it's <laughs> remarkable yeah I saw, I saw I saw him earlier in his career and I, I, think, I, I think I think I'm sure I've seen him get stopped a couple of times um, but he seems to have uh, he seems to have settled um, maybe just more composed a bit tighter cuts up a bit better um, but it's, yeah that's that's a really good fight but I, I, I favour Mikey really favour Mikey what about Luke obviously it's going to be a great fight between um, let's face it two elite level fighters but Garcia has shown that he has that you know special um, knockout power that he proved out in his last fight at 135 he does and uh, I'd say since the Kevin Mitchell fight with Linares I think he's gone from strength to strength yes. he has looked dynamite um, and he, it's like he's mature well I say mature and he's at that level he's already mature but he's yeah. just maturing like fine wine and he's just in his groove at the moment um, and Mikey Garcia can be the man to take him out of that groove again I think that fight is very 50-50 if the two get on I'm sure it's going to be a spectacular fight I, I think I'll edge towards um, Garcia due to the fact that he has shown he's got that knockout power uh, MJ in terms of these two fighters uh, is there anyone potentially of the two that you might say that might edge it well I mean just like every, I mean I'd definitely say 50-50 but again we do have to look at Garcia I mean his his record does actually say especially uh, with the whole Adrian Broner history as well <laughs> you, you, you have to look at Garcia and go he went, like you know. yeah, he went up in weight and he it, it didn't even seem like uh, it was a problem no no, no it wasn't it was yeah, it seemed like light work it's uh, I mean for that reason I mean Adrian Broner we've spoken about him on this podcast all the talent in the world has he got the application <laughs> I mean I mean, we've spoken about some of the things he does how he goes to clubs uh, he gets drunk and then he tells you that he runs back home afterwards, which is his exercise. <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 That's incredible. not quite. It's not quite Floyd Mayweather, but you know, <laughs> it's not quite Floyd. I like when everyone's like, "Listen, Floyd don't drink." He's like, "Yeah, but when I go to the club, though, I, yeah, he's saying he runs back home. It's just like it's ridiculous." <laughs> but no, I mean, I do have to side with guys, but it's a fifty-fifty. I mean, you wouldn't put you wouldn't put your house on it. Just put it that way. I mean, I'll put yeah. your house. <laughs> 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 my house in it yeah <laughs> uh, um, Luke I mean um, obviously MJ just mentioned the indiscipline uh, of um, Adrian Broner um, how important is it for you as a fighter to, to, to make sure that you're fully focused yeah you've got to be on it when you climb through those ropes you mentally subconsciously go for a little tick list have I done this have I done that have I done this have I done that and you want to be uh, you want to know that you've ticked all the boxes left no stone unturned because you there's people outside the ring doubting you you do not want to be inside your own head doubting yourself when you go into a fight you need to be 100% on point you talk about the, you know the mental side of things as a fighter I feel like uh, uh, Javante Davis possibly might be going the way of um, uh, Adrian Broner uh, missing weight a couple of times and up in the club and this and that the shenanigans you know I, I think someone really needs to grab a hold of him and say look you're remarkable talent 
you know, you really just need to, you know, think about boxing. I think that's hard for him with being the people that he's surrounded by. Um, I know Floyd don't drink, but if you're in those environments, you still put yourself at risk. You know, it's like a swimmer trying not to get wet. You're going out into these late clubs where there's drinking and people are doing whatever they're doing. You're putting yourself the temptations right there. That's true. Well, that wraps up for the boxing. Now it's interview time. Now this week I caught up with the new WBC silver lightweight champion, the Tartan Tornado, Josh Taylor, who fights Miguel Vasquez in Edinburgh this weekend. Let's hear from the man himself, Josh Taylor. Pep Talk UK, and I'm joined by the one and only Josh Taylor. How you doing, mate? I'm good, mate. I'm good, thanks. How's yourself? Not too bad. How's preparations going? It's going well. It's going really well. I'm actually ahead of schedule in, in terms of my fitness and weight. My weight's bang on. My weight's, my weight's really good, actually, this time around. I'm feeling really good and sharp for this one. You know, I'm really motivated, so... Um, Aye, I'm feeling good. Do, do you know much about your opponent that you're going to be fighting? I know a lot about him, yeah. He's, um, he's had 44 fights, five defeats, but five, them five defeats have been the guys like um, Canelo Alvarez and all them sort of guys, the guys at the top. So, um, Argenis Mendes, another one, another top fighter. So, <coughs> he's, he's been at the very top of the business and he knows his way around the ring very well. So, he's not your typical um, Mexican fighter. He's like a a counterfighter and uses his jab and his boxing skills so I'm going to have to be on the front foot I think and uh, counter his counters sort of thing So after that win against O'Hara Davis um, we see on Instagram mate you've been very very busy around the gym getting a lot of sparring in is it right in saying that next year is going to be a, a massive year for Josh Taylor? Yeah I think so I think it's going to be a big year yeah um, given that I get through this fight and this Easy camp. work, easy work uh, it could be, it could be, but then again, it could be a hard night's work. You never know until that first bell rings. So um, I'm, I'm just focusing on that at the moment. But if I get past this, or when I get past this, it could be a huge year next year for me. Yeah. Cracking stuff, Josh Taylor. We wish you all the best for your next fight. Cracking stuff, mate. All the best. Cheers. Thanks. All the best. Come fight night, Josh. Right. Finally. There's some boxing at York Hall this weekend and we see the return of the boxing bassoonist, a.k.a. the classical warrior, Hannah Rankin, our boxing correspondent Shaz, spoke with Hannah ahead of fight night. Talk UK joined by a lady that's making quite a name for herself. An international jet setter these days, flies all across Europe, gives the beat down to people that are champs, has got a CV longer than my arm, and I've got a pretty good reach, no jokes, I've got a pretty good reach, she spied everybody, it's the classical warrior, the boxing bassoonist, Miss Hannah Rankin, how are you doing Hannah? I'm good thanks, how are you? Do you like the intro? Yeah, it's a great intro, thanks very much. <laughs> I'm gutted about one thing. I always like interviewing you, but I always like having the big boss man, Noel Cullen, sitting right next to us. I know, he's not here today, unfortunately. He's away doing some stuff, so it's just me on my own, unfortunately. Well, the thing is, I usually feel that Noel keeps me in check, and I'm scared of getting a beat down from him, but seeing some of your fights, I've got, I'm scared of you as well now, Hannah. Oh, you should be scared of me, Shaz. Yeah, it's just that right hook, left hook. Combo. Yeah, there. And no, uh, you're in good safe hands, don't worry. <laughs> um, now, Hannah, you've been a busy girl. This is you've got your fourth yep. fight coming up Friday. Yep, Friday the tenth, down at York Hall. And there's a little belt on the line. There is, yeah, the international challenge belt. Quite exciting. So yeah, looking forward to that. And yeah, no, it's my first day rounder. I can't wait to get in there. It's going to be really great. Looking forward to it. Um, taking you back, you made your debut in Southend. Yep. Um, you had a points decision. Yep. You then had a second fight in Carl Shorten. Yep. Um, you had a very experienced opponent in there. Yep. And you decided to give a beat down for four rounds. Six rounds. Oh, was, sorry, my apologies. I was yeah. there for it. <laughs> Six rounds. Sorry, I just felt sorry for the lady because you were playing combos. Yeah. You had Noel saying something I've never heard. <laughs> Do the glove kin. Yep. <laughs> what is the glove kin? Uh, we've been working on certain things in 
training and just stuff that I'm learning when I'm watching training videos and learning stuff. So uh, it's working on different types of jabs. So we've all got different names for things. So yeah, it comes out in different different stances when I'm out there. So yeah. I thought it was like take one on the chin, the granite chin you've got, and then bash the bash the lady up. No, 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 not that. No. <laughs> and then you went away to Oslo. You thought, I've, I've lived these nights, I've been to Cecilia Bracus's fights. Shame on Michaela Lauren, ha 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 ha. Cecilia I know Bracus. you're a Brackhouse fan, but yeah, Lauren did a great fight, she was. It was a really no. good competitive fight, that one. Of course. The Norwegians, the Europeans, the Scandinavians all come out, flock behind her. You had a big stage, you fought on Scandinavian TV. Yep. Everything was set up, you did everything right in the fight. Yep. And then something that me and Noel had discussed beforehand, because yeah. I've seen it happen in Oslo, yeah. is judges' scorecards. Yeah. I had a bit of an interesting decision there. I got a loss. Um, it was very strange because I've definitely felt I won the fight, and a lot of people said to me afterwards, I definitely won the fight. So it was a bit disappointing to get the, the loss, but the experience out in, uh, in Norway was amazing. Um, being on TV for the first time on my third fight, it was incredible. Um, and being in front of so many people, it's definitely an experience I'll be able to take into the future with me as well. So. Some of my researchers have found out that, I don't know whether you're aware of this, Norwegian and Swedish TV actually announced as the winner of the fight. Yeah, it was announced that they thought uh, I'd won the fight, and then when uh, Joanna was announced as the winner, there was quite a lot of uh, surprise, and they were, I think it was something that said Hannah Rankin would be understandably snowed under by the decision, uh, so I think they meant I was a bit disappointed by it, but yeah, I was disappointed, not very happy. I did, I, 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 that appeared on my timeline as well, that was tweeted to me, because I was trying to find out the bizarre fight, because unfortunately I weren't there, and I put this, I was gutted, I really wanted to go out there. Yeah. Um, what was the contrast like, fighting in the UK, fighting in Norway? Was it a difference in setup, the way in, the fight night itself? Well, it's my first kind of like uh, live weigh in, you know, that's been broadcast on TV, so that was exciting. Uh, it's different. Um, doesn't beat like, you know, the buzz we have here in the UK for the fights. Uh, like, you're cool, I cannot wait to be fighting there next week because the, the atmosphere is amazing. Um, but it was great to find so m in front of so many people, um, and but they're quite quiet, you know, it, the crowds can be quite quiet until they get like slightly more into it. But over here, everybody's like really into it from the very beginning, so yeah, no, it's a different experience. I've, I've seen, even in, in Oslo, even in the front row, everyone's having a drink, everyone's having something to eat. It's almost like a family day out. Yeah, it's, it's quite chilled. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas over here, everyone's like straight into it, let's go. And there's two people in the ring bashing each other up. Yeah. <laughs> um, challenge belt on the line, what's going to happen Friday night? Oh, definitely coming away with the win for that one. I'm really prepared for this. Uh, looking forward to having eight rounds. That's four more than my last fight, and that's going to suit me just great. Really looking forward to that. Well, Pep Talk Boys are going to be there Friday night. Fantastic news. As traditionally is the case, Gar Fire away your sponsors and your social media handles. Yeah, I'd just like to thank JFB Sports. I'd like to thank Ammo as well for all the kit, especially the newly designed female groin guards. That's become really popular out there in the girls, so big shout out for that one. Um, I'd like to thank Secret Slots as well for helping fund my training trips and I'd really like to thank Science and Sport for all of the special help with uh, my proteins and supplements and things like that that's really helped and we'd like to thank Noel Cullen and of course I'd like to thank my trainer Noel Cullen and, and my manager and my manager Derek Williams and I'd like to thank all the girls out there that I've been sparring with uh, Chantel Cameron been up at Team GB with Sandy Ryan um, Natasha Gale uh, also had some good sparring with uh, Rosanna Cox as well just recently so I've been very busy and but thank, big shout out to all of them for all their help with the sparring it's been great told you she's been sparring everyone and your social media handles uh, yeah you can catch me on Instagram at H underscore U-L-L-A that's short for holler um, and then on Twitter it's at Boxing and Bassoonin and then of course just catch me on Facebook Hannah Rankin Hannah, I'm going to be there Friday night. Go get that win. Thanks very much, Shaz. I'll see you there. Cheers. Cheers. Lovely, lovely. Cracking stuff, Shaz. Now it's football time. So we're not going to review the international games, uh, but instead we're going to look at some of last weekend's results and the big talking points in the Premier League for the big games. Now, MJ, Chelsea... Beat Man United 1-0 at the bridge, courtesy of a Maratta header 
you know, they dominated Man United and they deserve the points. Back at B, you know what? I agree with everything you said, but I did kind of call this one last week on the pod. Okay. I said, you know what? Chelsea, this season, when Chelsea have actually taken jabs, what have they done? They have bounced back up, bounced back. They lost to Burnley. They actually went on to actually beat Tottenham at Wembley, which you might say, okay, it's not difficult. And when they've lost in the past, they have shown up. And after City as well, they've shown up. So it's just what Chelsea do, you know? Especially since, I'm not sure if you've heard the song that Chelsea fans are singing, the uh, N'Golo Kante and Timmy Bakayoko, they never... Or low way. I mean, literally, you could see the reason why Chelsea showed Nemanja Matic the door come the summer is because they've got this monster in Bakayoko and they put him alongside Kante and then they've signed Danny Drinkwater, which a few people went like, <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure about it because people are laughing at Drinkwater, but when you play that boy next to N'Golo Kante, bloody hell, fan, you'd be, are they some partnership or what? We saw Mourinho actually show up to the game, not trying to park the bus, which surprised us all. He tried, to, <laughs> he tried to go toe to toe with Chelsea, and I think we we saw it only went one way. I mean, I'm not sure what you made of the Morata goal. He had another opportunity. Classic header. Classic. Yeah, another one on one. I know it seems to be happening that way. As Pelicueta cross, Morata goal header. I think that's the that's the fourth or fifth time they've combined this season. Morata assists. And, uh, uh, sorry, Aspilicueta assist and Morata finishing. But, uh, it was, uh, it was a great, great super game. Thank you, I really did like that one. Yeah, it was a good game. And, you know, the, the good thing about Conte is, you know, when bad things happen, he responds, you know. Um, as mentioned last sure. week, they lost, you know, they've lost games. And, um, I remember the Arsenal game when Arsenal beat, uh, Chelsea last season. He responded. Yeah. What did he do? changed the formation yeah and Chelsea went on to win the league with that formation so Conte is a, a manager that pays attention to detail and he was helped by the, the return of Kante sweeping up the midfield and Chelsea they may not they may not win the league but you know I think they're going to uh, definitely challenge for the top four listen they're going to be there at their bounce they've really caught up with Manchester United come, I think it's three points in it now so like yeah so they virtually caught up with United but also the other big talking point David Luiz. David Luiz being out of the squad. Yeah. Out of the squad and a 17 year old actually on the bench. Luckily, Chelsea had no injuries in centre half, but Conte's interview afterwards when asked, when will Luiz come back? He goes, I don't know. He might never come back. <laughs> so, you know, Conte Thanks, is though. talking that talk, which, you know what, when you win, you can talk that talk. But no, it was, uh, it was a great spectacle. And um, definitely, the, it was it was right to be Super Sunday and the big game of the weekend. Yeah, and you know what? And you know, with Louise being uh, shoved out into the cold, the performance of Christiansen, mate, that is yeah. really a, a major positive for Chelsea. You know, you know what? They've had Christiansen on the books ever since he was about fifteen or sixteen, and right from the time when he was sixteen, they were like, you know what? This boy is going to be the next big thing. They sent him on loan a few seasons at Borussia Mönchengladbach. Germany, they yep. tried to recall him. They wanted to recall him at the start of last season, but Mönchengladbach were like, no way. We've got him for two years. They finally got him back. And Chelsea supporters do actually say, they've always said, you know what, this boy is a bit special. And Conte himself said, he's the future of Chelsea. But no, it was a great performance by him. Chelsea looked brilliant. Bakayoko absolutely dominated that midfield. Mm-hmm. It made us wonder why Manchester United still filled Marouan Fellaini. Fellaini, yeah, Fellaini. We, yeah. Could write, we could write a book and a dossier about that all day long. It's just, uh, it's crazy. Yeah. I, I know Bakayoko is up and down the field, but for me, his finishing leaves a lot to be desired, mate, you know. Um. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, I mean, you know what, Danny Welbeck, watch out. Bakayoko <laughs> <laughs> might just actually sh- uh, show yours off to be actually quite good. But but the thing about it is that he's a defensive midfielder. I mean, N'Golo Kante wasn't really like uh, a finisher or did many long shots whilst he was at Leicester. Kante has worked with him. And we remember the goals he scored against Manchester United. He scored two. One in the FA Cup last season, as well as one in the league. Both of them were beautiful, excellent finishes. 
and Kante is going to work with Bakayoko because they're seeing Bakayoko as the heir apparent to your Yaya Torre, that marauding midfielder. So that's the era type, yeah. Exactly, or Patrick Vieira from the previous generation. Someone who's going to dominate in midfield with his energy and actually sharp to actually nick up a few goals as well. So, yeah. But, but he's still not worth 50 million, let's be honest. Listen, at the end of the day, if Kante will 40 million, I'll tell you what, I mean, I mean, they're, they're both signed. Actually, Bakayoko, Chelsea signed for 35 million. Liverpool signed the Ox for 40 million. Ask me which one I would rather have in my team. <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy, it's crazy. The inflation of uh, average players, mate, is, it leaves a lot to be desired. But right. Speaking of inflation and spending money, um, let's talk about the money team. TMT, uh, Man City, mate, I call them TMT. No. Yeah. <laughs> as, as long as you don't start calling the TBE, we don't have a problem. Tim, <laughs> but if you start calling that Guardiola squad TBE, me and you have an issue. But, <laughs> but no, Man City, they, they they just do what Man City do at the moment. They just score goals. I mean, Arsenal, Arsenal, Arsenal. We've Arsenal, had so Arsenal, many, Arsenal. Yep. With so many people from the fan TV on the pod. And they would all have been shocked because even Sky couldn't work out Wenger's formation. I mean, no one really you know, thought was really going to play Coughlin as a centre half. Trying to reinvent uh, Coughlin as uh, Matthias Sammer or Beckenbauer. <laughs> I was like, what the hell is going on? Uh, uh, so, uh, I mean, Frankie B, you must have been fuming watching the game, watching this. I mean, it's of no fault to Coughlin because it is not his position. We've seen this before. <laughs> Marcus Wenger playing Hector Bellerin at left fullback. I mean I mean when is it gonna stop? I mean what what did you make of the game? How did you feel whilst we were watching it? And you know what, another prediction that was made on the pod last week was the fact that AOL would not start the game. How yes. did you feel about AOL not starting the game and the match as a whole? Uh, you know, to be honest, as much as I like AOL, Arsenal have a problem with defending. And I, I saw Wenger's thinking in uh, basically dropping one of the AOL because he, we needed a bit of uh, defensive um, solidarity, mate, throughout the team. Um, Cochrane and Sweeper, um, uh, that, that wasn't my idea. But Arsenal, um, their biggest problem is, you know, they've got a weak spine and they can't, uh, they can't defend. I know, I know, but Frankie B, if you had to drop one person from AOL... And then away game, who would it be? It would have been Ozil. But he played Nacho Monreal, Coquelin. So basically he only played one centre-half against a Man City squad that is more robbing and scoring goals. The manager, um, the whole thing needs, um, you know, it needs uh, ass- assessing. Listen, I, I, I thought Arsenal needs to start fan, again. I do have to say, Arsene Wenger, we want you to stay. <laughs> as long as he stays... Our opportunity for making that top four spot seems to increase a little bit more. By the <laughs> uh, we're talking about Liverpool. Um, you guys, you got a manager sack, mate, in victory well, over West Ham. Listen, we are literally just following in the footsteps of Arsene Wenger. What Wenger did to Ronald Koeman was terrible. He got Ronald Koeman <laughs> sacked. And Liverpool, Klopp has gone and has done that as well to slam on Bilic. So, yeah, but no, it was, it was an excellent game, Frankie B. From a Liverpool fan's point of view, it's been quite difficult. We'd, we'd only won one away game all season. So you can imagine the trepidation actually playing against West Ham. But, you know what, I called out on the pod last week. I said, you know what, we were going to win. It was more comfortable than I thought we were going to win by. And subsequently, we've seen Slavan Bilic lose his job. Yes. Which has actually set off a scramble because apparently both BT Sport and Sky are both fighting to pay him millions and millions to actually come over and become London. a London. To, be a pun- in, to be a pundit in the interim period. So it seems like in a week Liverpool gave Red at uh, West Ham a red nose and smacked them and got slab and lost his job. Everyone might be winning, apart from West Ham, because apparently David Moyes will be appointed as manager which West Ham fans are really not yeah. happy with. he is actually appointed you know hey, the funny thing is um, your team is struggling at the bottom of the league uh, and you know you go and make things worse and you go and get David Moyes you know no disrespect but he took Sun- Sunderland down listen you've got to give disrespect because we've seen this story before this is what happened last season Sunderland <laughs> put down 
I mean, what's it, Allardyce left and they appointed David Moyes and they got yep. relegated. So, That's it. yeah, you can't exactly blame West Ham fans for actually having some trepidation. I actually thought David Moyes would have tried to actually get the uh, Everton job. I thought that would be a good fit for him. I'm not sure if Everton fans will want him back, but I'm hearing Fahad Rashiri, yeah. who spoke to uh, Sam Allardyce. Apparently, he doesn't want him. He wants Diego Simeone. Simeone, yeah. Yeah, he wants I, Simeone. He, and money I mean, talks. So, listen, he's on another planet because, yeah. yeah I wouldn't be surprised if these what? things happen. Yeah, but Fahad Rashiri is not like a, a country. That's one. And two, they signed Rubinia. They needed to sign Neymar in order to make that <laughs> statement in today's what's the call. And trust me, Everton definitely do not have Neymar money. But you know what? We're definitely going to watch this space. But no, the game was uh, was pretty... I'm not sure what you made for it as a fellow top four contender. Because this season, it seems like this is what our football teams will be about. City are just so far ahead of everyone. It just... The race for the top four almost seems sadly as the most exciting things that will happen in our seasons. Yeah, like, what yeah. did you, of, the, of the Liverpool game, did you watch it? Did you check out the score? Like, I mean... Yeah, I saw I saw a bit of the highlights and I saw some atrocious defending by West Ham. Oh yeah. yeah you've got to remember Liverpool with the quick players, yeah, in Salah and um Mane, they're set up, mate, to to break down teams like West Ham. If yeah, it had it, been at um Anfield, yeah, they Mar- may not have conceded like that. It was it was actually funny because West Ham actually showed up the way teams show up to play against Liverpool. You play compact and just wait and then you catch Liverpool on the break. But the funny thing about it was that for the first like few minutes, it looked like they actually had a plan. But they got all go off to the corner, and then they actually get counted <laughs> from the corner. You know things are bad when you actually conceding goals when you actually have a corner. The opposition goes and scores. It, it, it was it was atrocious. And you know what? No surprise, Slavan has lost his job. I mean, his contract ran out. We only spoke about this last week on the pod. His contract was running out at the end of the season anyway. And he had actually come out over the last few weeks to say, listen, guys, my contract expires soon, so I'm going to talk that talk. Like, the board is saying that they offered me so many players this summer. Let me tell you what happened. Each time he would go and talk to the board, I want to sign player X. What they would do is that they would, if, if he says he wants a striker in the Premier League, just an average striker, they would offer him someone like Cristiano Ronaldo, to try to divert his attention. Just someone that was just unrealistic. And then a few weeks later, they'll just be like, yeah, nothing's happening, mate. So apparently he was quite frustrated by what was going on there. But um, yeah, all in all. Because they were meant to get William um, Cavallio uh, from Sport and Lisbon, but that, that never happened, did it? 40 million What's- deal. Well, to be honest, I don't think they ever had the ambition to actually spend the money to actually go and get Cavalia, which I think was the issue. I think Slavin Village had actually asked for Krokoviak, who actually ended up at West Brom, online from uh, PSG, yeah. said, you know what? Solid player. Go, yeah, solid player, defensive midfielder, and they told him, no, 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 we don't need to loan Krokoviak. What we're going to do is we're going to buy you William Cavalia. And apparently he's not convinced that they were ever willing to part with that sum of money to actually bring those players in. So, uh, yeah, I mean, you, you always hear about these things as well. Uh, I mean, this week as well, slightly different. We also saw, from a Nigerian and Chelsea sp- uh, perspective, Michael Emanala actually lived yeah, yeah, yeah. to actually go to Monaco. So we saw him quit the job, which is because a lot of Chelsea fans have actually been calling for Emanala out because they blamed him for the reason why Conte had actually failed to achieve his transfer targets in the past. So it'll be very interesting to watch that space to see what happens and who Chelsea actually hires because the person at Brandwich is put in charge of uh, of recruitment and everything was actually Emanala on one hand who was a good cop and the bad cop is the uh, the lady the, uh, the 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 Russian lady who was at Brandwich's former secretary who he trusts so well she was the lady who told John Terry you effing sign this contract or you leave the club. <laughs> when Don Terry literally sees a pretty hard nosed negotiator. So if that's who Conte is going to have to be doing business with, we don't know. Is it actually going to improve the fact that Emanala has left or are things going to get worse? And is Conte definitely going to leave from a football point of view? Very- it, it, it will definitely leave because he's, he's already on the edge. 
and should he not be happy with anything that happens in the future he'll literally just pack his bags and go Listen, I wouldn't be surprised I to Conte last week what did he say before the United game he said you guys are judging me like other Chelsea managers I'm not like them I don't care if they sack me that's what he said <laughs> so this is someone who definitely gives no Italian, yeah. <laughs> yeah, he definitely gives no edge I mean at the end of the day we saw him walk away from Juventus this is a man who did take Juventus on beating one season they were invincible he coached them to invincibility he told them you know what now guys I want you guys to sign me at player X, Y and Z Juventus ball were like no that's a bit beyond our budget and he just walked so if Antonio Conte tells you I don't mind being fired you know what he's absolutely right plus what's he <laughs> plus what's how, he... te- how can you tell your boss that I don't mind being fired listen he told him that <laughs> This is someone who everything he achieved in his first season at Chelsea, coming in with a disarray and winning that Premier League title, AC Milan, who are a club who have got Chinese ownership, they offered Antonio Conte a lot of money to try to entice him away. He didn't actually do. AC Milan spent a lot of money last season. I think we have to watch this space. They're going to be back again this summer. One, one year forward, one year into their project. They're going to see if they can actually attract them type of content. So he's someone who doesn't lose. It's like Guardiola. If you sack him, he'll get another job. Or any of these top managers, there, there's always another job around the corner. But but what is it with like Guardiola? A lot of people that I talk to, they just they just don't rate Guardiola. They say he's a money manager, and without funds, you know, he, he can't do anything inspiring. You know, he spent a whole load of money. Yeah, well, listen, I, I think it's easy enough to break it down. I mean, Guardiola was rumoured to be the best thing since sliced bread before he actually went to go sign for Bayern Munich. Now, unfortunately for Guardiola, Bayern Munich won the Champions League and the treble before he got there, the season before he got there. And the fact he didn't win a Champions League there, and in his first season at Man City, we saw him not being able to actually do anything. They ended up being trophyless. He, he, he had a... His record was worse than Pellegrini, I believe, in his first season. So I think when you look at all these things, I mean, obviously now this stuff, now this season, obviously Man City are looking to see if they're going to walk this title. But Frankie B, like I've told you before in the past, you could do it, I could do it. Any one of our listeners can <laughs> on Man City side. All they need to give you is Mikhail Arteta to actually run training. Because we might not be able to run training on a day to day. Get the oranges at half time as well from our Tessa. To pick the match day squads and to actually go ahead and actually pick winners, I think that anyone can manage that squad. It is that good. Yeah, but you know, uh, MJ, you got to put a bit of respect on um, Arteta's name. You know, he was uh, a midfielder. Of, was it ninety four percent pass completion? Listen, I'm sure. <laughs> sure Sideways completion, yeah. <laughs> Listen, I'm still Gareth Barry, and uh, also you know who has a higher passing record as well, uh, Abu Dhabi, because he hardly ever played football because he was always injured, and when he <laughs> played, he passed the ball sideways. It's easy. Pass completion means nothing. What did you do with the ball? That's exactly. I'd rather take someone like uh, De Bruyne every day of the week, yeah. and, and, and even uh, even De Nielsen had a high pass completion as well when he was at Arsenal. Yeah, it's because, it's, well, well, listen, well, put it this way. At City, De Bruyne actually has one of the lowest pass completion rates at Manchester City. Mm-hmm. And even though he's probably the best passer, yeah. because he it does more risky yeah. passes. He goes with the killer pass, yeah, that's yeah. what he does. A lot more killer passes than your David Silvers, who does nice little neat one twos and always tries to find the feet. So, pass completion is definitely not the be all and end all, frankly. How much to agree with. And you know what? Before we um, before we uh, call it a day, the offside decision, Arsenal's game, right? <laughs> Clearly offside, right? I don't know what the linesman has been smoking. And Raheem Sterling, for me, that was extremely soft. Yeah, because that, at this 2-1, is, when Lacazette I came on, Man City was shaking. Some of that Khalifa Kush. That's exactly what it <laughs> Taylor was. Taylor gang, yeah, yeah. That's the only way you could explain what the hell that was. So yeah, I mean, I mean, for for the penalty, I mean, Nacho Monreal, it was a little bit clumsy. So yeah, it was soft, but it was clumsy. But, but Sterling couldn't wait to he couldn't wait to go down. Let's be let's be let's be real about it. Listen, yeah. I, I, 
Listen, you say football is shoulder to shoulder. That's kind of what, that's what Raheem Sterling does. But you know what? You can't really blame mm-hmm. Sterling because there have been scenarios in the past in which people haven't gone down when other people have been clumsy and the refs don't give the penalties. So, yeah. I mean, we can't say Raheem Sterling did die. He did go down softly, but it wasn't a die. So, like, yeah. It's just, it's just one of those things. And you know, um, uh, Arsenal, like I said, um, Arsene Wenger, uh, he's, he, he really came out, uh, with, he pulled no punches, mate. You know, he virtually called um, Sterling a diver. Well, he did call him a diver. Yeah. And he said, then he said the referees were no good. Yeah. FA <laughs> charge uh, arriving pretty soon, I guess. Listen, the thing about Arsene, <laughs> the thing about Arsene, he's watched Mourinho and he's watched like other people deflect. So, like, yeah. I mean, it still doesn't explain why the hell he played Cockland at centre half. So yeah, he can say whatever the hell he wants. He can say there are aliens in his kitchen and the moon landings in his face. He can say whatever the hell he wants. But every single football fan is still going to go around and be like, "But you played Cockland in centre half, though." That's just all it comes down to. It's uh, yeah. I mean, w- when you think Arsene Wenger can't shock you anymore. He just pulls something up his sleeve to just show you. But no, Frankie B, I agree with you. Potential FA charge hanging over Monsieur Wenger. That's right. And you know, and I'll still keep moving forward and we keep overperforming. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> you know right. what? Right, yeah. Yeah, the Arsenal Go. just keep on, they keep on giving the fan TV so much content. Seriously. <laughs> it's, 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 listen, it's a big conspiracy. You know what, we should not be worried about uh, Stan Kroenke, the fact that he's making money off Arsenal. I think he's actually bought Arsenal fan TV secretly, and he's engineering all of this stuff in the club (laughs) to make sure that he actually gets double his money, double his buck. He's earning money there and money elsewhere as well. Yeah, Wenger's getting some big commissions. You know, I heard after the the Man City defeat, he he went home and had some Ferrero Rocher with a bottle of wine. (laughs) <laughs> to be honest, you know what it wouldn't actually surprise me with some caviar as well for dessert so yeah it's just it's just what Benga does you know it's Saturday night hey <laughs> <laughs> alright oh. that's our time um, thanks MJ I'd like to thank uh, Luke the Duke uh, Big Xavier and the man MJ himself join us again next week for another Pep Talk UK podcast don't forget to hit the subscribe button and leave your comments in the box below. Thank you. Pet.